Hello and welcome to today's webinar with the Faculty of College of Arts and Sciences, Math and Natural Sciences Division. This is part of our Grout Orientation Program. I'm Stephanie Stiltner. I'm the Director of Family Connections and I'm part of the Grout Committee. Um, We're here to welcome students to campus. Um, in addition to completing the Canvas course, we have the information on there that you need to review and complete. Um, we offer these webinars so you can get to see us and know us and learn a little bit more about our programs in depth. Um, as I said, today we'll be talking with the faculty from the Math and Science Division, but if you have other questions outside of that topic, you can absolutely ask those as well. We have a um, few housekeeping notes I wanted to cover, um, just like with most Zoom um, group sessions, if you don't care, keep your microphone muted. Um, unless you're talking or asking a question, but feel free to use the comment section and ask a question or turn on your microphone or camera and you'll wave your hand and get our attention um, throughout our conversation because it is about students and families. We want to make sure that you have the time to ask the question, get the information that you're here for today. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. I will introduce Dean Dugan, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, start us off. And then we'll just kind of go around the room and let the faculty introduce themselves. And then we'll get started with our questions. Hey, hi everyone. Um, this is Jennifer Duke and I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And I first want to say how important it is for us to connect with you in this way. Uh, there's so much virtual happening and we wanted to at least show up live and record this so you can get to know faces and ask your questions. Um, I'd also like to say that the people you see on your screen are the best of the best in math science education. Uh, so anything you wanna know about in terms of career opportunities, the skills that you'll learn, the experiences that you'll have, um, what, what Career fields are available right on the UPike campus, including uh, pathways into our optometry and osteopathic schools. This is the time to um, wonder and ask about those things. And I have full confidence that this group uh, will, will answer you with, with all kinds of enthusiasm and passion. So thank you very much. And I will turn it over at this point to Dr. Robert Arts who is in our physics program. Hello, uh, my name is Robert Arts. I'm a professor of education and physics. Uh, I also oversee the half the division of math and natural sciences in terms of uh, computer science, mathematics, earth science, and physics programs. And so I uh, help coordinate those faculty and those programs in those areas. Uh, in addition to that, um, I myself teach physics, uh, primarily introductory physics for non-majors, uh, physics for uh, all of our science programs, so biology majors, chemistry majors, uh, and miscellaneous special topics courses along the way from uh, digital electronics and robotics to 3D printing and uh, things of that nature. So uh, welcome, and uh, if you have any questions, be more than glad to answer those. Okay. Okay, who's next? Let's start with um, Dr. Holcomb. My name is Michael Holcomb. I'm professor of mathematics and coordinator of the mathematics uh, program. Um, I teach uh, mathematics all the way from, I've taught the developmental math in the past and the contemporary college math, all the way up to the calculus, the linear algebra, differential equations, the stuff that math majors take. In addition, in the past, I've also been a faculty advisor for an anime club. We once had an anime club on campus. And uh, hopefully uh, in the next year or two, after the social distancing goes away, uh, faculty sponsor for a board game club, which one of our students is interested in pursuing. And I've also been a um, assistant coach of the quick recall, which is like you buzz in and answer trivia questions in the past. If you have any questions about math or board games or um, uh, quiz bowl, uh, just let me know. Okay. Kay, will you go ahead, please? Okay, I'm Kay Johnson, and I am one of the four faculty members 
in the chemistry area. You can see like this is my fabulous background of chemistry stuff in here. And so that's what I do. <laughs> so I'm so looking forward to answering any questions that you have about chemistry or anything at all about uh, UPike. Then we're just gonna get it. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. I'm going to Darla next. Hi, I'm Darla French. Um, I am in the biology department. I'm the program coordinator for biology. Um, if you are going to take biology in the fall, you'll probably see either me or Dr. Whittier. I teach the introduction um, principles class for the freshmen um, that are coming in. So I may see you in the fall. Um, I also teach things like botany, uh, nature of science, ornithology, senior seminar, I teach a couple of courses over in physical education, a dance class and a self-defense class. Um, and so I kind of am on campus a lot and around in a bunch of different places. <laughs> so uh, welcome and we look forward to having you on campus in the fall. We'll go to Carla next. So I am also in the biology department. I'm an assistant professor of biology. Um, I teach uh, an introduction to biology for non-majors and also evolution and some vertebrate courses like vertebrate zoology and vertebrate anatomy. Um, I'm also uh, uh, taking over the biology club as the faculty advisor. So I'm excited about uh, the biology club this year and hopefully we'll be able to still do some fun things despite the social distancing um, and such. So looking forward to meeting you all. Johnny. Hey, I'm Johnny Fleming, uh, associate professor of math. Uh, been with uh, the university for 11 years now. Um, and right now I'm pursuing a PhD in instructional design and technology. And uh, mostly in the math department, I teach uh, classes for first year students, uh, beginning and intermediate, excuse me, beginning and intermediate algebra uh, and some contemporary college math. And look forward to meeting all of you and answering any questions that you may have. Thanks. Uh, let's go to uh, Dr. Wong next. Um, my name is Bang Huang, and I'm teaching math in UPike. And I taught uh, all the way from developmental math and whatever the math major is going to take. And my specialty is doing for the applied mathematics, so more related with all the science and math and computer science, or like applying together and work as like a cohort, like figure out problems and issues. And I know you guys are a little scared of math and they probably hate math or doesn't like math that much. But trust me, if you take my class, you're gonna learn a lot of things from me and you're gonna change your mind for that, okay? I'm looking forward to meet all of you and I'm very excited to see you in this semester. Okay, so um, let's open it up for questions. Real quick, if you want to, um, to make sure we answer your questions in case some of you can't join us for the full hour. Um, does anybody have any questions straight off the bat? Okay, we will go ahead and um, just go ahead and I'll throw some questions out and we'll have some conversations. Faculty, if you don't mind, at some point during our conversation in the, in the comments, Go ahead and um, add your name, title, and your contact information. That way students can follow up with you um, later after the call if they want. Um, and so we'll have that information handy. Um, so students, families, feel free to use that if, if, you, if you wanna reach out to any of these folks after. So <coughs> um, one thing that um, Dr. Let's say Bang just mentioned about um, we got math, science, the biology, chemistry, physics, um, math, those things as a person who holds two communication degrees scare the bejesus out of me. Though those classes are intimidating and um, I'll just throw this out there, they just, um, they're, they're hard, especially when you talk about those classes, taking them from a high school to a college level. You know, maybe my high school, um, I didn't have biology since I was a freshman. And then here I'm coming into a collegiate level, college level biology course or a math course. Um, so he mentioned that how we have, um, how he kind of ease those fears and make you feel comfortable. Darla, you said you teach a lot of courses for first year biology students. 
and even a course for non-majors, if I'm correct. Will you, will you talk about that a little bit, how you kind of um, ease those fears and debunk some of those myths of like science in college, you know, how heavy that is and the lab work and, you know, those things that we may not understand. Yeah, so um, we, we work really hard at UPike to try to get you guys feeling like you're actually a science major <laughs> when you first come on campus. And so there is a lot of um, coordination sort of between us and chemistry and math. So we try to really help you guys see that we are a network here to help you succeed um, and also give you some experiences um, that will actually make you feel like a science major um, and also help you kind of try to figure out what's going on with college life. So we do um, have a first year studies course that you'll be enrolled in along with your science or your math classes um, and whatever gen eds you might be in. And that first year studies course is gonna help you be able to start getting to know the folks on campus and the different departments on campus that are gonna be useful for you. Things like financial aid, um, you know, the business office, but also student services, looking at um, co-curricular things, things outside the classroom. Um, we also have a great uh, division on campus that is responsible for helping you with tutoring. So if you find that you need help in the classroom, more help outside of what you're getting, um, you can always go to that resource as well. So I think we're, we really have a strong network in place to help you start figuring things out. Um, especially we see a lot of times our students who did really well in high school might struggle a little bit coming in just because it was so easy in high school. <laughs> you might be a straight A student in high school and then you find that in college you have to buckle down and study and you might not know how to do that. So we've got resources in place to help you to figure out how to do the studying piece as well. Um, additionally, I think that we have a, a really great group of faculty um, that are all here. You know, we want you to succeed. I think sometimes students coming in, um, if you're not familiar with what the college experience is, it can be a little intimidating to ask for help. It can be a little intimidating to approach your professor and say, hey, I need some help. Um, and so I think we are a pretty good group and we're fairly approachable. So at least one of us you will find <laughs> that you can have a good connection with. Um, to reach out if you need it. So anybody wanna add to my spiel? If I can just really briefly piggyback on that, um, I think you did a, a wonderful job of explaining just kinda how, uh, as a new student coming in, there's, the, there's that intimidation factor and that sort of thing. And I think you'll find quickly, uh, no matter who in this group uh, that you end up with you know, in your first semester, you'll find that we're all, uh, here for you first. Um, our main focus and our main priority is teaching you guys, um, and and we're here for for support and for help. And you know, I have students coming all the time to talk to me about math questions. But then, oftentimes we get into conversations about other things, about other issues that you may have. And so, I, I want you to know that that. I think uh, I can speak for everyone and say that uh, that our doors are open and I know that's cliche but like for real our doors are open and we're here for you um, and we're here to support you and we can't wait to watch to watch you succeed and watch you grow and watch you mature um, and eventually watch you uh, get your degrees so um, uh, thank you for that and then in addition to that uh, also for some of the math courses and some of the uh, chemistry courses and what we've kind of deemed the quote unquote difficult courses on campus, um, some of those courses actually have some embedded uh, help in them as well. Um, they have uh, some instructional assistants that'll come and they'll be in the class with you. And it's students who have typically taken the course and, and had good success in the past. And so uh, they're upper class students and they're there uh, to assist you and to guide you. So it's a kind of an extra resource. And so you'll hear more about that as you sign up for those courses, but uh, I just want you to, to kind of hear that from us first and know that, that those things are put into place for you and with you in mind and, and with your success in mind. So, yep. Okay, any more questions from our guest? Use the comments and, and I'll read them aloud and we can go that way if you want. If you just wanna kinda stay in the background, that's fine. I'm watching the comments, so type those in there anytime. Um, Dr. Holcomb, why don't you kind of walk us through um, what a typical math class, I know they're all different, different topics, um, different approaches maybe, but what, describe one of your math classes. What, what can we explain in your classroom and your teaching style? Well, um, 
I guess I'll focus on calculus one because I think I've taught calculus one the most over the past three years uh, of the courses that I usually teach. Um, typically, there's a, about a week of review of you won't see limits until the mm, fourth or fifth day of class. Um, it goes pretty briskly, but I mean, uh, we also um, have that support that Johnny was talking about and, and you know, the tutoring and the, you know, instruction. And um, it, it's a mix of computation and concept. Um, let's see. I, one one thing that I try to avoid is I, I don't want any single assignment worth like 30, 40, or 50 percent of the grade. So typically calculus for me is five tests and a final and some embedded quizzes. I think the final last time I taught it was only 20 percent of the course grade. So it's not like you've got half your grade writing on the final exam. I think there's, I think the higher percentage, you know, of the weight on the final, I think it, there's more pressure there. So I, I try to go 20 to 25% max. Um, try to incorporate examples, that, you know, that are applicable to daily life. Um, and, uh, you have any questions um, about those, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Wong, math. So, what t walk us through a couple, maybe of your classes, a couple different types of classes, what to expect, and is there any hands-on uh, opportunities for hands-on? And like he said, um, Dr. Holcomb said, you know, relating it to some real-life activities and trying to make it app applicable how do you do that? Um, so what I like to do is to like giving so instructions with like a certain type of problem. And after I've done something, and then I like to give a student a similar problems and they will set them up with the groups. They can work it up together. So if they have done it, have seen it, the process, so that will be easier for them to actually like do the problem themselves. That will easily uh, build up their confidence and then, then make them feel like, oh, wow, this is actually not that bad. So if they can perform the same thing in the classroom, then after the classroom, they should be able to do it, you know, on the homeworks and later on on the quiz and stuff like that. And I try to incorporate a lot of like a, a application problems and motivations in my classroom and trying to set the students to understand the reason why they want it, they need it to learn this mathematics, okay? So either it's learning the math, then it can figure out the high for the tree or finding the high for the building or setting for like a triangle for a trigonometry class that they, they can solving some sort of problems or yeah, things like they can see it in a common life. They can relate it to mathematics. It's like, oh, actually I do can use the knowledge and applying to our life. So that kind of gives them like motivated and feels like, oh, what I learned in college, it's actually not useless. It's actually applicable. So it's great things. So that's kind of like my approach and my strategy for that. Good. And Good. any of the triangle stuff is gonna be useful in physics, right, Dr. Ertz? If you're comfortable with right triangle trigonometry, you're gonna nail the physics class. Hands out. <laughs> Well, that's why I was getting ready to kick it over to you, Dr. Arts, because we, we talked about, um, I started from a personal perspective, you know, I was intimidated by those classes, and because usually with the math and sciences, it seems like students are really excited, they're already coming in career-oriented, driven, they, they know what, what their end goal is, they know they want to go to graduate school, professional school, and then sometimes they're fearful of the, some of those classes. We have a lot of students on one, either one end of, those, of that spectrum. So now let's flip it over to the other end of the spectrum that students, um, they, they're coming in and maybe um, 
they know they want to go into professional school, medical school, something like that. Do you care to explain a little bit more about our scholars program with optometry and osteopathic medicine? And then um, talk about maybe a little bit of those career paths and, and how we kind of laid that foundation on the undergraduate side. Yeah, we have two professional school scholarship programs. We've had the, the scholarship program with the optometry college for, oh gosh, 10 plus years. Um, and it's called the uh, Osteopathic Medical Scholars Program, OMSP. Uh, and essentially, you know, primarily we do recruit the students for that program uh, as seniors in high school that want to come in. They have a professional interest in going to medical school. Uh, and what they do is they're set up on a certain career path, a track of courses uh, that they take in sequential order. Uh, very specific, uh, almost dictated schedule, uh, but uh, the idea being that you're taking courses that are not only allowing you to finish a degree in primarily chemistry or biology, but at the same time getting support courses that the medical school uh, requires for you to be successful in the first year of, of their program. Uh, having passed through that information and successfully graduate uh, with all those courses and a, and a particular set GPA and an MCAT score, uh, you're guaranteed walk-in admission to the medical school. Because essentially you've been interviewed as a fresh, you know, as a senior in high school prior to arriving to campus. Now, in addition, we do have some alternate pathways for sophomores and juniors that are current students at the university to matriculate into that program. So if we have extra slots available, um, and you've presented yourself as a strong student uh, in your general chemistry, your principles of biology, your physics, organic, and so on, uh, you could apply and actually be part of that program the last two years or three years of your academic program uh, in which they would set you up with the ability to study for the MCAT, practice problem sessions, uh, peer learning, because you'd be with a cohort group. Uh, similarly, uh, we have a program with the uh, Optometry College as well, so uh, OSP, so uh, the Optometric Scholars Program, and it's very similar. Uh, also recruited as seniors in high school, uh, particular curriculum path, uh, courses that support your both undergraduate and first year graduate courses in those programs. Uh, and they too have a set uh, GPA and a set uh, OAT exam uh, that would uh, allow you to be successful in those programs. Uh, again, also guaranteed admission if you complete the required courses and the GPA and, and uh, professional school exam points. But even outside of those two programs, I mean, all of our courses within the this math and sciences are set up to be supportive of that professional school interest. Um, not all of our students are, are wanting to do that, and you may not want to do that. Uh, we have lots of different career paths that will uh, extend beyond uh, the undergraduate level in, in both the, the mathematics areas and the biological and chemical sciences as well. Uh, but if you are interested in professional school path, we do have a very rigorous and supportive curriculum for those programs. We've had a tremendous uh, success uh, with our graduates that uh, want to go on and, and pursue those things, whether it's uh, the programs we have on campus of optometry or osteopathic medicine, or if you wish to go to, to dental school or to pharmacy school or a physician's assistant program, uh, any of those kinds of professional programs, we can certainly uh, have the, the desired paths for you as well as the success in place for you to be, uh, be ready for those programs when the time comes. Good, thank you. Um, any questions about, about that specifically? In particular, Stephanie, I, I will say that um, uh, for the majority of the program for uh, the osteopathic medical scholars, um, I've been the primary advisor. Uh, Dr. French is taking over those responsibilities to be the full-time advisor. So anybody that's in that program, uh, you'll have one advisor uh, 
for that program. That way you get consistent information. You've got a place, you know, repository of, of knowledge and answers to questions you might have. Um, I am also myself the uh, full-time academic advisor for the Optometric Scholars Program. So if you're interested in optometry uh, or that program in general, uh, I am the primary advisor for that program and, and will continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, if we don't have any questions, we'll hop on over to chemistry. So, um, Kay, if you don't care to tell us, talk about the structure, um, kind of what a class, chemistry class looks like, and then a chemistry lab. Well, at least for my classes, like uh, class basically looks like, I mean, or at least we hope, like it looks like we're all in groups like so a lot of my students like I design my classes around teams is what I do where there's actually four to three people per team and in the team captain to the research assistant to the uh, chief recorder and the cleanup artist so those are the actual four roles <laughs> that I have like so and basically the students are assigned into teams and they become one of those people for each one of their experiments. And so it's really cool that it, you can become the captain in one week and you can become the recorder another week and then you can do the um, The actual research assistant one week or you can be the cleanup artist. So it's just, it's a rotation of who is going to do what and like that's what I've been doing for a very, very long time. Students really seem to like that approach. The um, actual uh, other universities and uh, professional programs actually use something very similar to that. So especially if you're um, thinking about pharmacy school with Marshall, Marshall's program is completely designed around team-based education in their entire program. So I have very good connections with those. <laughs> so, and uh, I'm excited, of course, about um, basically working with the students in their teams. Like they seem to blossom in that case and, and actually like helping each other out. And um, that's, that's also in the lecture for me. <laughs> so generally speaking in the lecture, students actually have teams for the actual lecture components because I like to actually do what, as they were saying, Dr. Wang was saying, basically that the students can do their problems after I actually go over the problems. I'll then put students in groups and they can actually work on the problems together. And that way, by the time you leave the lecture, you actually understand what it was and you're not necessarily listening to a lecture for an entire 50 minutes. <laughs> so. So that's the thing, like, so I generally don't do that, uh, if I can at least. <laughs> so I'm one of those people that I like to turn over the reins to the students and actually get them working on stuff and um, just make chemistry fun because that's what I'm all about. Like I literally am, like, I'm sure you can probably already tell that. Like, so I got this fancy cool background. I got like my own stuff and it's like, I'm just so excited to be here. I'm really not gonna lie. Like, <laughs> so, I mean, really like to even see any of the students names I'm honestly almost on the brink of tears I mean so so I'm just I'm really really excited to be here I just cannot wait to meet you guys in real life like I mean because this is gonna be awesome you're gonna be great this is gonna be awesome go you fight go bears all right awesome thank you thank you we appreciate that um so I know Carl I'm gonna put you on the spot make you follow make you follow that but so talk a little bit about biology your your courses and then um, you know in labs but maybe speak a little bit about field work because we do live um, some of our biology faculty have talked about how we live in some of the most biodiverse areas in the country and those of us that are from here we we may not appreciate or see it just because it's normal normal to us so talk about how we can step out just outside of our buildings on campus and what we can find just truly in our backyard Yes, that's a really good point. Uh, we do try to take advantage of the, the natural beauty in our area uh, here in Pikeville. So um, U-Pike actually has a, a small property that's like the biological field station that was donated 
And I've been trying to take advantage of that area for my vertebrate zoology course. We actually go out and uh, catch salamanders in the stream and um, learn how to identify them um, and that sort of a thing. I know that the principles of biology course that the majors do, they do a lot of going out to the uh, local park that's just a few minutes away called Bob Amos and look at the different um, plants and animals there and do a, a few little uh, field studies for the labs. Um, heard a lot of good things about that. Um, so we do really try to take advantage of, of the the amazing biodiversity that we have here. Uh, Dr. Whittier um, is an uh, entomologist and knows all of the insects of our area um, and has a really cool entomology course where he actually teaches the students how to create an insect collection and identify insects. So uh, I think we do a, a pretty good job here in biology of um, getting students to actually go outside and, and see the amazing nature that's, that's out there. Anybody, Carl or Darla, do you want to add to that? I'm going to add, I wonder if you can hear the ice cream truck in the background that's playing music. It must be in our neighborhood. <laughs> hey, it makes me hungry. Um, just to add a little bit to, to what Carla mentioned, I think we, we do try to incorporate, um, of course, ev almost every science class has a lab. So you're getting hands on already with that. Um, but we do try to get you outside in taking advantage of, of the natural history in the area. We also have opportunities for study abroad. And so that's another opportunity. It's not necessarily associated with a particular class necessarily, um, but you have the opportunity to you know, go to Belize with the biology department and take advantage of the natural beauty and the ecosystems that we might find in another place. Um, so Belize is one example. Um, we also do some domestic trips around, just around in, in country. Um, we've done a camping trip down along the Gulf Coast. Uh, last time we did that last summer was down through Florida. Um, so we also try to kind of push your boundaries in terms of experiential learning and, and taking advantage of hands-on in the actual setting where those organisms are found. You're on mute, Steph. Um, anything else on experiential learning? Math, physics, chemistry? Anything else you wanna kinda of talk about what we've done or maybe what plans that you may have? Put you on the spot there. Well, I know physics has a has a club uh, not physics chemistry has a club also um, American Chemical Society chapter of uh, chemistry students on campus and they've been doing a lot of outreach so going to schools and kind of doing experiential learning in that setting where you become the teacher you become the facilitator um, and so there's opportunities in that type of setting as well um, physics Dr. Arts was it last year Dr. Arts you ran the physics zoo which was for the local school kids um, and we had college students that assisted with that. So doing demonstrations um, from a physics standpoint. And again, you sort of become the teacher, which is really kind of cool. You kind of flip your, your own role, right? Instead of being the student all the time, we try to give you guys opportunities to actually, where you become the expert and you can do some teaching on your own. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the physics zoo, Dr. Arts? Well, just the, not, not necessarily the zoo in particular, but uh, we have a, a large outreach program that we do with the public school system. Um, we, we've had some projects with them over the years, and uh, in particular, the students that are in the classes, uh, the science classes, get the opportunity to help with those programs, whether you're you know, pre-education or whether you're just pre-professional and you want the opportunity to get some hands-on experience um, working with uh, all levels of, of students from kindergarten through high school. Uh, we run, like I said, the, the Physics Zoo program, which is uh, sort of like science museum exhibits that we set up that people can interact with, uh, self-guided. Uh, we use students to staff that. Uh, we run, uh, we're one of the state regional hosts for the Science Olympiad competition. And so we pull science students in to help uh, oversee and actually be event supervisors for those different events. 
uh, that we run uh, for that competition, and that happens uh, uh, late February, early March every year. Uh, we do uh, demonstration shows out in the public schools. We've done summer science camp programs in the past, and all of these involve a uh, heavy aspect of volunteerism, especially on the part of our, uh, of our own science students that get involved, uh, again, whether they're uh, interested in the education field or not, it's that experience of, of being the teacher and, and being the resource uh, that's been quite valuable. Yeah, and as Dr. Arts mentioned, it doesn't really matter what career path you're on, you will find that volunteer opportunities will present themselves across campus. So you'll find some here in science, you'll find some sort of, sort of in general, um, and anybody who's going to go anywhere after you pike professional school, into a job, you know, whatever, you need those opportunities, those volunteer opportunities and uh, kind of contributing to campus and contributing to society. So we try to provide those opportunities for you guys as well. Exactly. And those service learning opportunities are um, absolutely essential on resumes, academic resumes and um, future applications. Right. So um, also to add to a student's academic portfolio, we offer honor societies. Right. And where there's opportunities for um, travel to conferences and presentations. I know um, math and sciences do a lot of that. So I don't know who could best speak to that, but um, I know, well, you, the clubs, your clubs, they raise money. Your clubs raise money throughout the year to, to pay for those conferences and things like that. So I don't know who, I know Darla's shaking her head. I think she's, she, she's involved in everything. Hey, I'll jump in here if you want. Um, so Dr. Vanderbilt's gonna be taking over bio club. Um, and we do have a biology honor society, so she'll be heading that up as well. Um, we have a general science society called Sigma Zeta, so that's for math and science um, all together, and that's uh, Bernadine Cochran, that's the advisor for that, for that group. Um, we also have opportunities where you can apply for funding to be an intern, whether it's an intern here on campus where you can work with somebody to do a research project. Um, we have some students who have received scholarship money um, from our Appalachian College Association to do that. Our uh, faculty member who teaches anatomy and physiology has two students this summer. They're working on tissue samples and doing some histology experiments. Um, and so that's a, an awesome opportunity as well. And it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody here though. We've got lots of programs that you can apply to um, to go elsewhere and get paid for 10 weeks over the summer to do a research project somewhere on another college campus. Um, and so there are opportunities there to kind of grow your to grow your resume and to grow your skill set um, doing these internships uh, all of these things you know as well as your GPA will determine your eligibility for the honor societies um, and so that's something that you can kind of keep in mind too for for growing your resume thank you questions from our students no I guess we're doing a daggone good job of covering everything. How about that? Um, how about we go around the room and kind of give um, one piece of advice to you know, an incoming student, take yourself back to when you were fresh out of high school, preparing for your first year of college. Um, what's, what's one thing you wish you had known when you were in their shoes? Let's start with Carla. No pressure. <laughs> um, I would say study regularly and often. Um, I think a lot of students think that they'll just cram the night before the exam, uh, but that's typically not good advice. Um, if you just regularly study after each lecture and kind of organize your notes and constantly um, you know, reorganize it into different ways so that you're having to think about it and think about it as you're learning it, um, that will really um, help you out throughout your entire college experience. Perfect. Dr. Wong. Um, I would recommend you guys to don't be afraid to go to your professor's office, okay? Because you, if you need a help, if you're stuck in some problems for four or five hours, please do not do that, okay? Just go see your professor and then just talk to them about it, okay? You probably can figure out the problem in 10 minutes rather than you just stay in your bedroom and try to figure out four and five hours along, okay? Go see them if you have any problems. 
perfect. Dr. Arts. I was kind of going to echo what Dr. Wong said, you know, just open line of communication. Um, you know, faculty don't bite. I mean, they're, you know, they're, we're all very friendly, very approachable people. You know, whether it's, whether it's a discussion about the class that you're in with that faculty member or whether you just need to come and sit and vent about some other class that you're in or just your life or whatever, you know, go to a faculty member's office, you know, you know, hang out, sit on the chair, sit on a couch, have a conversation, you know, be a real person. Um, you know, we, we have lives outside of the university as well as you do. I mean, we have things we're interested in and that we do. And, you know, maybe you'll find some commonality. Maybe you'll find a way to connect with somebody on a level that you didn't expect before. Um, and as a result, your comfort level is going to increase not only with that person, but, you know, your faculty across your other courses as well. So it's, it's beneficial just to, just to have just a casual conversation about, you know, what your hobbies and interests are. You'll, you'll learn a lot about somebody and, and you'll feel more comfortable being in their class and asking those hard questions, like Dr. Wong said, that you won't go spend four hours on the homework. You'll be like, hey, I need to go reach out to him right away. I don't understand this. I got it wrong the first time. So that, that's a, it's a real advantage to, to have that connection early on, because if you can do that when, you know, within your first semester, uh, those other semesters are going to breeze right along. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Dr. Holcomb? Um, don't think it's the end of the world if you lose a 4.0 GPA. I can tell you from experience, when I lost my GPA, when my GPA plummeted from 4 to 395 at my fourth semester at Oklahoma State, I thought my junior and senior years would be miserable. Turns out, I enjoyed my junior and senior years at Oklahoma State like three times as much because I didn't have the weight of the 4.0. Finished in the upper three eights, didn't get into University of Chicago's PhD program, but Purdue was a pretty good school. And, I, and I'd also like to add, so we, we in the math, math and Natural Science Division offer not just the biology and chemistry. When you apply to med school and uh, optometry school, the prescriptive courses that Dr. Arts gave you all I think all of the applicants are going to have to check those check marks off. If you can distinguish yourself with a computer science class, calculus, linear algebra, probability and statistics, you may find yourself years and years from now getting a doctoral degree and being an osteopathic medicine professor. But then you're like, I've got an opportunity to write an app for medical procedures or whatever. If you've got a computer science background, the apps will be easier to write. Maybe you'll go into one of those studies where you'll see the single blind, double blind, one sample mean, two sample mean tests. Get yourself a statistics class so that will be easier to understand if you find your career going in that direction. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Kay? Live. Like, I mean, seriously, like college is what you make of it. Like, so that's the thing. Like, and obviously definitely come and see any of us. Like, you know, our doors are definitely open doors. Like this is some of the best of the best that's in this room right now. And I'm like, yeah, I, it's just gonna be awesome. I mean, like basically make sure that you actually be you. That's the thing. Like, so don't just like sit in your room and not socialize and things like that. I know it's gonna be very difficult this coming fall, but even we got Zoom, so you got Zoom even, you know, like then you're still gonna live like you know, so with Zoom, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> so, so even right now, as you can see, like it's very easy to get into Zoom. So even if that's what we got, then that's what we got and stuff is gonna happen and still go Bears. Like, thank you so much for showing up. We're so excited that you're here. Like, this is just so awesome. This is just great life, great times. Go Bears, you Pike rules. All right, come on. That's awesome, that's awesome. Johnny, I hate to say it, but you're going to have to follow that. I knew you were going to ask me to follow uh, Dr. Johnson. Uh, well, that's that's awesome advice. And so uh, I'll echo that just a little bit and say uh, to you, step outside of your comfort zone. Um, get into something, get involved in something that you 
aren't sure about. And if you get into something and you decide that you don't like it, that's okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but you'll never know unless you try. So um, look for programs on campus, look for clubs, look for organizations, look for groups of, of uh, like-minded individuals and go and be part of those groups. Um, find things on campus to do uh, that you may not ever get to do again. So that's my advice. And go Bears. Thanks, Johnny. Okay, Darla, what you got to add to all that? Yeah, so um, I'm going to echo something Dr. Art said, which was be a real person. We have sort of seen a, that thread throughout a lot of people's response today but um, it definitely is true I mean we want to get to know you that helps us in four years when you're ready for a letter of recommendation request it helps us to be able to write a good strong letter of recommendation and all of these things that everybody else has said you know get involved in other things um, you know step outside your comfort zone all of those things are going to help you better be a better rounded individual and if we can see that if you get to know your faculty and we can see who you are it helps us be able to get you to the next step um, can I jump in and answer a question from the chat? Um, Emily asks, uh, on the first day of classes, will it be more of an introduction and a materials list or will we dive right into work? Um, that's a complicated question and the answer is pretty simple. Uh, both so and it, and it really just depends on what class so some of your classes the first day uh, will be more of an introduction uh, some of your professors will have you doing things where you're getting to know folks in the room and things like that and then some classes you'll jump in and you'll be ready to, to go and you'll be uh, getting material and digesting material and doing work on the first day so my advice is just to be prepared for all of that. Obviously, you want to have all your textbooks, you want to have all of your materials ready to go and, and kind of be ready to jump in on the first day. And that way, if that happens in the classes that you sign up for, then then you don't feel like you're missing out on something or, or the, the worst feeling in the world is to come into a room and feel unprepared. So just be prepared for anything and, and everything and you should be good to go. And I hope that answers your question, Emily. And thank you for asking it. I'd like to and I think this yeah, go for it. Go for it, Mike. I'd like to add to Johnny's point. Sometimes we faculty give what's called a syllabus quiz. So the material might be pretty easy, like what's my name? What's my office number? Um, will there be makeup quizzes and stuff like that? So pay attention on the first day to those kind of details if the professor gives syllabus quizzes. Well, and, and I'd also like to say that, you know, to sort of echo what, uh, what Mr. Fleming said, that the it, it, there's a lot of variation. And in particular, you might actually have some of your courses that are fully online. And if that's the case, um, and, and with all of your courses, face-to-face -face or online, you know, check your Canvas, uh, you know, our learning management shell regularly, check it early before the start of classes. Uh, likely a chance is you're gonna see uh, some introductory stuff there from your faculty member that sort of introduces, whether it's the syllabus or themselves or both, the course in general. Um, and then from there, they may actually want or need to get started with the material on the first day of class. Um, given that you know our uh, fall one uh, term is eight weeks long, I mean, there is a lot of material for your courses that is gonna need to be covered. And so it's likely that the majority of your courses, even those that are face-to-face, -face, are going to have some sort of assignment or some, some formal lecture material on that very first day of class where the instructor previously may have done something differently. They're probably going to place, a, again, a video or an instructional materials uh, related to their course and related to, you know, to your lessons and your syllabus all on Canvas. Um, hoping then on that first day that they can jump in sort of with the material and get you uh, sort of indoctrinated in what to expect for the rest of your semester. Exactly. And that's, that's really one of the main points of our webinar series is to show that we're humans, show that we don't bite, and, and it's physically impossible to bite through Zoom. Um, <laughs> And so, and even whether we are in person or you are in class, you have it online or whatever the circumstance is, we are still here and we are approachable and relatable and available. I mean, that's, that's the biggest point. If you take nothing out of, 
else away from today is that you see these faces and you hear our stories and you know who we are and you know that you can reach out to us anytime and if we can't help you we'll point you in the right direction so darla i interrupted i'm sorry yeah um well there was another question in chat about if we're online will we be able to access resources like the library and other public places that could pose a risk for covid exposure and so i think the the not satisfying answer right now is that remains to be determined. I think, you know, even if we are in online classes, I think in an ideal situation, we'd love to have campus open to where students can still go to the library, can still access the cafeteria and all that good stuff. But I think it's really just gonna depend on where we are August 1st <laughs> and what the CDC guidelines are. So it's not a satisfying answer, Emily, and I'm sorry, <laughs> um, but we will have more information about that. And our, our dream is that we'll be able to be back face to face and see you guys and we won't have to worry about that issue. Um, but reality is suggesting there's going to be at least probably social distancing guidelines in place for the fall. What that means for classes, we don't know yet. We're still working on it ourselves as faculty. Yeah, and we um, had, we recorded a webinar with Information Technology and Library a couple weeks ago. And Edna Fugit, our Director of Library Services, she addressed that, um, talked about preparing the library for social distancing um, if we, you know, we need that. But also, she also talked in detail about the wealth of information that's available online and by chat and by Zoom of the librarians and things like that. So, Emily, I can get you that link and you can watch that video too. But yes, that will be, library services are available um, online as well. All of our student support services will be available online. If, if students are online, our support services are online. Uh, there's another question in chat. Um, I, I would love to say who it's from, but I don't think iPhone asked the question, so I can't do that. Um, but anyway, uh, they asked, uh, can we talk about how uh, that faculty go about helping athletes to make up work when they have to miss class for, for games? Um, and that's a great question because, uh, for example, fall sports athletes, um, are, are you know they're they're on campus a majority of the time but they do occasionally have to travel for games and things like that so the main thing and the, and the first piece of advice i'd give to any student athlete on campus is to communicate with your professors so if you have to miss class that's okay we understand we work with student athletes all the time matter of fact over half of our students are student athletes so uh, we're all very comfortable with uh with making arrangements and sometimes those arrangements might happen before you have to leave so uh, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I give quizzes and sometimes those quizzes happen on Fridays. And so a lot of times uh, my football players will have to leave on Friday if they have an away game and they're not able to come to class. So if they'll tell me ahead of time, which most of them do, uh, if they'll tell me ahead of time they have to miss, then we will make an arrangement. We'll set up a meeting in my office uh, prior to them leaving. Uh, they'll come in, they'll do their quiz and they'll all, they'll not have to worry about it and then they could go and they can focus on their game and focus on their trip and, and focus on having a good time and enjoying that aspect of college life. So long story short, yes, we absolutely will. Um, we'll work with you. Uh, Kylie Gollihue, uh, that name sounds really familiar, Kylie. Uh, I hear you're a, an awesome soccer player. Um, but yeah, so uh, yes, we will absolutely work with you. Just just communicate. That's the main thing. And, and to follow up with that, I mean, it, it's what I said before. I mean, keep that open line of communication. And it's whether you're uh, going on an athletic trip, whether you're going on an academic trip, whether you simply need to be out of town for some family business of, of some kind, go talk to your professors ahead of time. Don't just disappear for a day or two out of class and then instantly show back up and say, oh, I had to be gone. Can you help me? If you knew you had to be gone, the, your your best recourse is to reach out ahead of time. Um, particularly with athletics, you know, we do get a list of students that are supposed to be traveling, but at the same time, we have a lot of classes and a lot of those lists, and we don't often sometimes see your name or or make a, a connection that someone's in one of our classes, especially early in a semester where we might not know everyone yet. So it's really critical to reach out to those faculty and say, hey, I know you might have received an email uh, about the soccer team traveling this uh, on Tuesday. Uh, I'm going to be going on that trip. I noticed we had a quiz scheduled or, or hey, I, I don't know if we've got anything scheduled. Can you tell me if I'm going to be missing anything? 
So again, this just the open communication line is going to carry you so far. I mean, you you can't even imagine what that's going to do for you as as just setting the groundwork for for being responsible and taking that initiative, and that's going to make such inroads with your faculty that you will be you will be surprised how far that's going to take you throughout your career. I'd like to add a uh, maybe a five word phrase that you can remember from this uh, growl session. Proactive is better than reactive. Very true, Mike. Any other closing words or questions that we have? Because that's about our hour. So I was going to be respectful of everybody's time, but make sure we have, we shared everything we wanted to share. We good? Thumbs up all around? All around? Well, I'll be remiss if I didn't ask Dr. Johnson to close us out and tell everybody bye. Yeah, well, this is so awesome. Like, thank you so much for showing up. We it was so awesome like and if you have any questions all of our information is posted in the chat window you can definitely reach out to us i'm sure we're all checking our email a lot i know i am pretty much every single day i'm online trying to check my email for something so like if you want to reach out to somebody for sure you can definitely reach out to me and i'm sure other people obviously are checking their email and would definitely be excited to hear from you so Definitely, we're super excited. Thank you so much again for showing up. This has been awesome. Great job, everybody. And obviously, again, go Bears. Welcome to you, Pike. Thanks, everybody. Bye.